And so we believe there's going to be an economic advantage there to where you're able to feed your cattle uh, for less per day uh, to help drive some more profitability back to the farm and ranch. But the other part of that is that this provides um, some insulation to things like drought. Uh, you're able to, to uh, grow feed consistently of first cut quality, Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I am your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, where we connect you with beef industry experts and leaders to improve your own operation. Speaking of improving operations, I'd like to personally invite you to attend my monthly Rancher Mind events. Rancher Mind events are Q&A calls between cattle producers and industry experts that allow you as the cattle producer to enter a community of people who support and push you to find those improvements and connect with experts who can answer your questions and guide you in the right direction. You can find out more about these events and how to sign up by heading over to my website, casualcattleconversations.com. And while you're there, if you sign up for my newsletter, I'll send you 22 ranch management tips for free that have been shared by the gurus who have been on my show before. Remember, the best way to support podcasts is to share, rate, and review the show so that I know what episodes and content you like and want more of. With that, let's connect you with this week's guest and expert. Well, thank you, all three of you, for joining today. And I'm excited to talk about this research project. We're going to talk about some innovative stuff with cattle nutrition and barley fodder. And I know my listeners will really enjoy that. So before we dive into that conversation, I do want my listeners to kind of get a better understanding for who each of you are. So would the three of you kind of go around the table and just briefly talk about who you are and kind of what your role in the beef industry is today. So Brady, let's start with you. Okay. So my name is Brady Blackett and I am a, as far as I know, I'm a fourth generation cattle producer here in the state of Utah. And I've always loved the cattle industry and have always wanted to be that to be a part of my life. Um, not only just, uh, you know, from something that I'm passionate about, but um, from a career perspective as well. Um, I raise a little herd of uh, purebred Angus cattle and uh, we have our own uh, bull cell each spring. Um, that's, that's super fun and it's an exciting opportunity for me as well. But uh, with this particular project that we're talking about today, um, I work with a company called Renaissance Ag who has established um, a fully automated, self-contained, uh, controlled environment ag system that will grow and sprout barley fodder in six days. And uh, we've partnered with Utah State to learn more about its place in the uh, cattle industry um, and how we might be able to benefit uh, cattle producers in today's world. So that's a little bit about myself. Well, thank you. How about you, Kara? Uh, so my name is Kara Thornton Kurth, and I am an associate professor here at Utah State University. So I've been here for a little bit over seven years. Um, I have a PhD in um, animal nutrition. So I got that from University of Idaho. And um, my major role here at Utah State University is in research. And so my the kind of goal of my research program is we study growth and development of beef cattle and the most consumer accepted way to affect growth is through nutrition. Um, so I also study a fair bit of beef nutrition. And then I have a minor role in teaching. And so it's always fun to have these industry partnerships to kind of share up and coming technology with my students as well. Well, that's exciting. Well, Zach, I guess it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I graduated uh, in the spring with my bachelor's in animal science from Utah State here, and uh, then I started my master's program uh, with Dr. Thornton, and so I, uh, I uh, help with research here, and I take classes, and 
Um, pretty much anything Kara wants, anything Kara needs me to do, uh, <laughs> I try to try to take care of that. So pretty pretty minimalist, but that's that's me. <laughs> Well, it's exciting to have all three of you on the show today and to talk about this topic. So to really give, you know, those listeners out there a little bit of background on what we're talking about, can someone explain, you know, what is barley fodder and what does it look like from a nutritional value as a feed source for cattle? So what sprouted barley fodder is, um, it's basically where we are taking uh, barley seed, the parent seed, and we're introducing just a couple of ingredients um, in a controlled space, uh, water, um, temperature, and airflow. And we're able to sprout that parent seed into uh, a feed, uh, barley grass, in six days. And we're able to do that because of the controlled environment space that we're utilizing. Uh, so we have established a technology um, that allows us to do this in a fully automated way. We found that uh, people have been sprouting feeds like this, whether it's barley or wheat, for hundreds of years and utilizing that as a, as a forage or a feed resource in their feed program. Um, but they've never really been able to to do it successfully, um, but with some of the new innovations in agriculture and the controlled environment systems that we've uh, developed, we're able to, to do this and sprout that feed and uh, provide a consistent, reliable resource to ranchers every day. So anecdotally, I'll add that there is something to the technology because I've been trying to grow it on my bathroom counter without a system for a couple weeks now, because I think my my new goats might like it, um, but it is not near as efficient as <laughs> when um, that grows it in one of the systems we've gotten from Renaissance Egg. Um, but from a nutritional standpoint, the fodder is actually a really interesting feed because the nutritional value looks like it's somewhere between a grain and a forage, which I'm sure you can imagine since it's a sprouted grain, it has the forage on there, but it also still has the energy density in it that you would typically find in a grain. Um, the other thing is the digestibility of it is much higher than you would find in either a forage or a grain. So there's a little bit more moisture in the seed. The seed's been ruptured, so you don't have this hard outer layer that you need to get to. So it's higher in protein. Um, it's higher in energy and the digestibility is higher. So it's just a more nutrient dense source, but it's also um, more digestible. So from a nutrient density perspective, it's it's been a, I was really excited about the prospect of being able to work with it. Well, thank you for going through and explaining that and talking about, you know, what it is and, you know, nutritionally what it can offer to diets for ruminants. So how about you kind of dive in or someone dives in and talks about, you know, what was this research project and what was kind of the goal of conducting this project? How was that set up? Yeah, so um, what we did in this study is we took 20 cow-calf pairs. Um, so we got a little bit excited about the study. And so we were like, oh, let's go ahead and get started. And we started over the summer. And so what we had available to feed was cow-calf pairs. So at Utah State, we have a Vitel system that allows for us, that former, formerly grow safe, um, that allows for us to collect individual intakes on animals. And we had groups of cow-calf pairs that either received a diet that was all poor quality alfalfa. Um, so pretty common kind of stored alfalfa feed that you would feed to beef cows. And then the other half of the animals received half of that poor quality alfalfa. And then the other half, and this was a unique study from a research perspective because we did it half as fed. So it was half um, poor quality alfalfa, and then half barley fodder um, that was produced by a pasture box system that we 
um, are essentially borrowing from Renaissance egg to do the research. Um, so we fed these cow-calf pairs for 90 days. They received their diets. And we looked at weight. Um, we looked at body condition score of the cows. Uh, we collected milk from the cow. So Zach is now an expert beef cow milker, um, not something most people do during their graduate program. Um, and we also collected rumen fluid from the cows as well. So we just wanted to get a perspective of when we include this in the diet of animals um, at a level of 50% as fed, are we affecting health? Are we affecting growth? And then we also looked at some other parameters like room and health and um, components in the milk. Well, that's really interesting. And, you know, from a perspective, you know, you said that cow calf pairs is what you had on hand and that fits perfect because a lot of the listeners out here today or whenever they're listening to this show, I guess, um, are cow calf producers as well. So what were, what were the results or, you know, what did you kind of discover as you um, completed the first round of this trial? Yeah, so the results we found actually weren't what most researchers would get really excited about. So we got really excited because we actually found that there was no difference between our animals um, from a statistical perspective. So we didn't see any difference in weight gain. We didn't see any difference in body condition score. And so to us, um, we're really excited to run the economic analysis because from what we've seen so far, it seems like this is a viable option that producers can use as a different feedstuff. Um, one thing we're really excited about to continue doing research on is that we did see a numerical increase in average daily gain on the calves that received the fodder treatment compared to the ones that got just the alfalfa. So their average daily gain was 1.6 pounds per day as compared to 1.4. Um, but I do want to point out that wasn't statistically significant. So I wouldn't completely hang my hat on that yet, but I'm, I'm excited to do more studies. So we didn't see any difference in animal performance, um, but what's really interesting to think about is that animals that were receiving the fodder, they were receiving roughly 60% of the dry matter as the animals getting just alfalfa. And so we're excited to run some economics on this to see if we feed um, our current hypothesis is that if we feed a more digestible diet like the fodder, that we're able to get the same or better performance from animals with giving less dry matter. Well, that is very exciting for you. And I'll be excited to see the economic analysis as well um, and see how you progress with this project. So Zach, with you on the project, um, how did the cows react when they were eating the fodder? Did they like it? Did they sort for it? Like how did their behavior kind of change between groups? Uh, it was definitely, there's a big difference. I, we fed, uh, we had the pen set up. So we had a treatment group and a control group, treatment and control. And you could tell which ones were which because those cows would stick their nose down deep in the, in the bunks and they'd find what they're looking for. Then they'd flick everything out. So, I mean, I, I, I'm a pretty clean person and I try to keep <laughs> everything nice and clean, but I'd come out there after I'd feed and there's, feed everywhere because they're sorting and making a mess of it. And they really love it. Like Kara talked about, it's highly palatable and that's, they're sorting to look for that stuff. And then the other cows, I feel like maybe got a little jealous <laughs> looking around, <laughs> like, like getting so excited about this alfalfa stuff, but it's, uh, I definitely think they, they love it and they look for it in their ration. So. Well, that's, that's interesting. Um, and so as we kind of look at the bigger picture of this whole project, what does it, what do you, why are you excited about it? What do you think it means for beef producers? I mean, Brady, you're pretty boots on the ground. So why are you excited about these um, units and the barley fodder in this research? What do you think it means for the future of the beef industry? There's a lot that uh, we're continuing to understand, right, through research. And this first trial that we did was actually just the first of three studies that we're going to do. Um, in the beef industry, um, but particularly as it relates to the uh, cow-calf sector of the industry, um, 
you know, I've, I talk to producers all the time, every day, uh, whether it be uh, friends of mine or potential um, customers of ours at Renaissance Ag. And there, there's a, you know, it's pretty common amongst producers that uh, we're facing some difficult times in the beef industry. Um, one of which is a drought that we're right in the middle of. Um, being able to find adequate sources of, of uh, quality forage to feed our, our animals consistently is, is uh, one of the common uh, obstacles that, that I see producers faced with right now. Um, not only uh, are they not able to have as much you know, native grass to, to, uh, to graze, but for those that are producing their own feed, uh, in most cases, their farms are not producing the amount of feed that they need to feed their cattle through those winter months. And so what it's doing is it's causing them to have to, to go out and buy feed. And uh, in, in our little you know, part of the beef world here in the state of Utah and through other parts of the Western United States, to go out and find um, a, a quality form of, of uh, feed in alfalfa or whatever that may be is, you know, ranging anywhere from 275 to over 300 bucks a ton. And when you start to run the numbers, um, those cows over the course of, you know, four or five months, however long you're feeding them, they're going to eat, you know, almost as much dollar amount in hay as the amount of calf that they're producing that next year. And so why this research is important is because like uh, Kara pointed out, what we're seeing initially is that the cattle are, that were on the test, you know, they consumed about 60% of the dry matter that the uh, control group cattle uh, consumed each day. And so we believe there's going to be an economic advantage there to where you're able to feed your cattle uh, for less per day uh, to help drive some more profitability back to the farm and ranch. But the other part of that is that this provides um, some insulation to things like drought. Uh, you're able to, to uh, grow feed consistently of first cut quality um, every day. It doesn't matter whether it's raining outside or whether it's uh, we're right in the middle of a mega drought and there's no water to irrigate with or to grow feed with. We can grow the same consistent source of feed day in, day out to take care of our livestock. Another thing that I would add to Brady's point that makes us really excited about these systems is I don't think that they just have value in areas that are going through drought, because um, we know that everywhere our population is increasing. So everyone's probably heard or seen the statistics that have come out that um, the population of the world will exceed 10 billion by the year 2050. And so with that increase in population, we're seeing a decrease in available land to farm. And so these systems provide options for producers to get feed um, if they're in an area where there's not as much farmable land around them without having to bring that feed in on either a truck or how, however it is that they bring feed in. Well, awesome. Thank you for sharing that too, because I know, I mean, we're always talking about creating sustainable operations for ourselves and our own workload and using our resources and maximizing what we have available. So that's a, that's some great insight. Thank you. Well, that, that is really neat. And I mean, feed cost is often the largest input cost for so yeah. many beef producers. So any way to lower that helps everyone's bottom line. So that's why I'm really excited about this research. So with that, do you have any specific stories of producers and how they're using these boxes or really benefiting from the fodder at all? Yeah, that's really what kind of, uh, that's, that's really why we engaged with Utah State is because early in our company's history, and, and we're still relatively new, we're still, I would say, in the startup phase, we're just a two-year-old company, but early in our existence, um, I talked to a lot of 
cattle producers and I was actually shocked at how many of them had been sprouting whether it was barley or wheat or some other cereal grain and feeding it to their cattle um, I found a ton of anecdotal uh, data that was out there right and uh, the producers loved it they all raved about the consistent quality they raved about the results that they were seeing with their cattle and uh, so that's really what caused us to engage Utah State because as a company, it's important for us to understand the truth. Um, we don't want to sell anecdotes to any farmer ranch. Uh, we wanna sell them the truth. We wanna help them to understand the benefits that this is going to have on their operation, not only uh, nutritionally for their cattle, but also economically and where they may be able to see some, some benefits um, on their farmer ranch. So. Um, there's a lot, like I said, a lot of anecdotes. Um, I've compiled a list of about 10 producers that have been seeing um, results uh, that range from, uh, you know, increased weaning weights on their calves, like uh, Kara mentioned, um, to just overall herd health being uh, benefited from including a live green feed into the diet of the cattle. So it's, it's exciting uh, to be a part of this research and to participate and to have such amazing partners like Kara and Zach to, to help us understand the science. Well, that's really neat. Now kind of switching gears and back to the application on this or the future application of this barley fodder. How is that being fed? Zach, did you feed it in like a TMR or how can you get that to cattle for them to consume? So what I did is I uh, measured out what I produced that day out of the fodder box. And usually it's about 200 pounds is what I was getting out. Um, and I put that in, my, in a vertical mixer and I'd add in 200 pounds of alfalfa on top of that and let it mix. Usually for a TMR, you're not mixing it for that long. But for this one, to break up those fodder uh, biscuits into smaller paddleable pieces for the cattle, uh, I let it mix for about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and then I just go through and put it in the bunks that way. And it, it mixed up really well and uh, got it even dis evenly distributed throughout the, the feed. And I mean, that's how we did it for the last one. We're going to do something similar for the next couple of trials. Awesome. Brady, have you heard of any other um, ways of feeding the fodder? Or is that the most common one? So that's kind of the way we prescribe it best, right? Because as Zach indicated, the cows will sort for it. Um, it's almost like cow candy to them if, uh, you know, it's like Halloween, like getting an awesome little, you know, piece of candy that you just can't wait to tear into. Um, so we, you know, our prescribed uh, way of feeding it is if you're able to mix it and blend it with the other type of dry feed that you're uh, including with it, um, that you're able to mix it um, just to avoid that sorting um, that is common when the cows get on this feed. Um, but I have uh, encountered several producers, um, one of which is a large producer down in uh, Colorado. And they have, they feed round bells and they'll take a round bell and roll that round bell out. And then they follow it just with a little trailer and the little fodder biscuits on the back. And they just throw those out on top of the, the round bell that they've just rolled out. So they feed it kind of as a component and uh, the cattle, you know, they'll go in and obviously they're going to go for that live sprouted feed first. <laughs> they, they eat that first and then they consume the dry feed that's been put out with it. So it's, uh, those are a couple of ways that uh, we know that it can be fed and has been fed. Well, thank you for sharing that. As we kind of wrap up today, is there anything else the three of you would really like to share about the project or the concept of feeding barley fodder? I, I just think it's super interesting that we can feed less dry matter to these animals and still see the same results. And uh, like I mentioned before, the next couple of trials, we're doing a backgrounding uh, feedlot trial and then also a finishing trial. And I'm, I'm really excited to see if we can still keep those same results when we include different um, amounts of barley in that, uh, sprouted barley in that, in that ration. So 
to me, I just think it's something that for so long we've been focused on dry matter and it's all about the dry matter and they need certain requirements. And I'm not saying those aren't right or aren't correct, but I think when we have different ways that we can feed our animals more efficiently with water or whatnot, that it's something that we need to look into. And I'm, I guess I'm really excited to see the results of the next two trials that we're doing. Well, that is very exciting. And I think, you know, as Brady was talking about the example of feeding the fodder by rolling out the bale and then putting the biscuits down, I think it'd be interesting to see a uh, green sprouts on snow, I guess, if you're feeding in the winter, but maybe that's, that's just because the snow is flying today. <laughs> that would be a cool picture, right? Seeing cows uh, in snow with basically green grass in front of them. <laughs> yeah. All right. So where can people go to learn more? If so they... you, can, you can go to our website, renaissanceag.com. Uh, you can get in touch with us uh, there and uh, we can we can uh, answer any of your questions. We can get you in touch with with Kara and Zach on the research as well. Um, but we're we're super excited about the future of this. Our goal as a company is to be a a foundational partner in production uh, with the cattle producer. Uh, we want to introduce ways in which they can improve um, not only their nutrition program for their animals, but also improve their profitability and their bottom line. That's our goal is to, to partner in those ways with, uh, with cattle producers. So we're super excited about it and we welcome uh, people to reach out to us anytime. Well, awesome. Well, to all three of you, thank you very much for being on the show today. I know my audience will appreciate this and I certainly have appreciated all of our conversations in the past couple of weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day. <laughs>